Okay, so we're talking about the robot lady says we're recording. We are talking about some garden pests here tonight. I appreciate the opportunity to join you through Zoom here this evening. Uh, I put together sort of a packet of pests that I often get questions about uh, when they pop up in the backyard garden or in uh, more commercial settings as well. Uh, some things that are not necessarily unique to Kentucky, but it seems like we contend with on a fairly annual basis. And what I wanna do is go through the biology of these different pests and also talk about some management methods for you here tonight. The ones I wanted to start with are the ones that it seems like at this time of year, I often seem to get more and more questions about. Um, I'm waiting and sort of wondering if we're gonna see these this year. Uh, those would be the slugs and the snails. So slugs and snails are usually springtime pests, but they can also pop up in the fall. Uh, they really like to pop up in those times of year because those are the more sort of damp times of the year where there's gonna be that high moisture content and they are gonna find the world is a lot more comfortable to them. But so far this year, we have not been as wet as I was anticipating. Um, last year, we seemed to deal with a lot of slug and snail inquiries. The Western part of the state in particular, a lot of the soybean fields, it seems like they dealt with a lot of slugs. Now, I am an entomologist. I like to talk about things with six or more legs. I like it when things have an exoskeleton, uh, and I really like it when they have antenna. If you look at a slug or a snail, you will notice that they have none of those things. They're not insects. They don't belong with the insects or the spiders. They're a gastropod, a mollusk, if you will. Um, they are still sort of yucky, though, and people don't really like them. And when something is yucky and gross, they tend to lump it in with the bugs. And so that's why an entomologist is talking to you about these two organisms here tonight. So slugs are the ones without the shells, and then we got the snails with their shells. So when they are, are popping up in backyards or when they're popping up around uh, the fields, what they like to do is to munch on the thin leaves that they can find. In terms of sort of local or landscape issues at your house, you're gonna find them feeding a lot on hostas. They love to feed on hostas. It seems like uh, one of their favorite foods. We also see them on lilies and violets and other plants, anything with those kind of thin and soft leaves. Um, soybeans are a favorite when it's in the early part of the growing season. Um, we see them on a few other garden crops as well, but hostas are definitely the number one inquiry that we get. When slugs and snails are feeding, they prefer to do this at night, and they like to be in areas that are kind of overgrown. So if you have an area of your landscape, an ornamental area that looks like this, or if you're somebody that is like me that really likes to jam pack everything that you can into your raised bed or into your garden or into your field, um, you will find that the shade and the kind of UV protection that you produce by doing that, that often attracts slugs and snails to live in that area. They don't tend to want to be out in the open um, unless they can find ground cover during the day, something to hide under, so rocks, logs, uh, things of that nature, where they can avoid that UV radiation. They definitely can't dry out. They are covered in that sort of precious slime that they need to, to survive. When slugs and snails feed, they do so in a rather interesting way. Um, I have some little animated videos here throughout the talk tonight that kind of show different things that I'm trying to discuss with you. And this is showing you in sort of a sped up fashion how these snails are feeding. Um, it's not super sped up, but you can see they've got a delicious looking cucumber there in front of them. When they feed, they have this sort of circular mouth at the front of their body. The mouth opens up and inside of it is this sort of, it's a tongue-like object. It's not a truly a tongue but it's a rasping sort of file-like structure. And they push it out of their mouth and they rub it really quickly over the thing that they wanna eat and it grinds it up for them. And then they slurp up whatever sort of slurry or goo that they produce as they do this. And it creates pretty characteristic damage. Those kinds of irregular looking holes that look sort of like a caterpillar's uh, kind of damage or when they're feeding on fruits and vegetables, um, it kind of creates these pits and divots. In terms of identifying these problems, it really boils down to usually the time of year that you see the kind of damage that we're talking about. So if it's something that happens first uh, in the year, if it's the first kind of pest problem that you're seeing, it's been kind of wet, um, that's gonna be a good indicator that you're probably dealing with a snail or a slug issue. If it's the fall, it's kind of the last pests that you're dealing with, that's also another uh, potential indicator. The other thing that helps with slugs and snails is the way that they locomote. So slugs and snails, like I said, they don't have any legs. Instead, if you look along the base of their body, you see uh, this one crawling on this man's hand here. I believe that's a banana slug. 
when we look at it, you can see there's this kind of ribbon along the bottom of its body. That is called the foot because scientists are not very creative when we name things. And so they just have a giant foot that runs along the bottom of their body. They're able to create a vacuum-like effect with this foot thanks to the presence of what we call snot or slug sort of uh, a goo all over their body. And it helps them to seal their foot to the ground and create pressure so they can push themselves forward while they kind of like use the rest of their liquid filled body to create this uh, wave like motion that you see on that person's hand. Now, when they do this, they're going to leave some of that snail snot behind. And you'll see these shimmery trails usually in the morning. Sometimes I like to go out and stand on the deck when the dew is still on the ground and I can drink my coffee and I will look around and it will look, you know, kind of like a kindergarten. There's all this snot that's been wiped along the deck or on the trees and you can see where the slugs and snails have been going. It's a very characteristic thing that they produce. So you'll see that damage on your leaves. And if you can pair it up with this kind of symptom, then you will know what you're dealing with. In terms of control, one of the first things uh, that we would do with this, I like to talk about things in terms of integrated pest management. So thinking about all of the various tools at our disposal. And one of those tools that we would point to is cultural control changing some of the practices that we use in a particular field or in a landscape to make the area less habitable for the pests that we're dealing with. With snails and slugs, we can do that by increasing airflow and sunlight into those areas. So if you can open it up, make it sunnier, uh, make it less shady so that they don't have places to hide, if you can get the air whipping through there, that will all help. Uh, if you improve soil drainage or you remove objects as well, like pavers, stones, logs, decorative items that may be near the area that you're growing, um, all of those are harborages for these. And so you can definitely cut down on their population by doing that. There are also some traps that we can do. Traps can be for monitoring if you would like to implement that kind of IPM, if you want to look for these pests. The sort of most primitive version of a snail or slug trap is a board trap or stone trap. You place these heavier objects out around the field that you're trying to protect, and then you flip them over in the daytime, usually around midday, and if you see them underneath, it means that you may have a problem in the field. Um, they want to hide there because it's nice and shady and usually damp, so they're not going to dry out. Another method, one that I kind of prefer to talk about, is called a beer trap. Now, if you are in a wet county or you can travel to one, you can, of course, acquire some beer. Uh, if you can get probably the cheapest beer that's available at the gas station, whatever comes in kind of a 96 pack or something to that effect, Natty Light, whatever it is. If you can get that beer and then pour it into a saucer, uh, a pie pan, uh, this one seems to be the base of a, a plant pot that you like a house plant pot. And you can take that sort of water dish off the bottom and fill it with beer. So you can have one for you, one for the slugs, one for you, one for the slugs. You set these traps around. It's very alluring to them. They like the smell of the alcohol. They'll crawl into it and then drown on the bottom and you can count them up and figure out what kind of pest pressure you're dealing with. The other thing is that you can coat susceptible plants with things like diatomaceous earth. Diatomaceous earth is an organic method. It's something that a lot of people like to employ for pest control when they're in that organic world. Um, it's fossilized diatoms. So it's a bunch of crushed up fossils and it makes this gritty powder. And when slugs or snails and even insects crawl through it, it's death by a thousand cuts. It slices the exterior of their body and they will perish because of this diatomaceous earth. It does work. You can see this snail on uh, the other, the left side of my screen here is struggling with some diatomaceous earth on it. Um, I will say that once diatomaceous earth gets wet, it is no longer effective. It gets all clumpy and glommed together. So if you put it down and then it rains a couple of days later, you may have to reapply it in order to get the actual control that you want. There are also some slug and snail baits that are out there, things like iron phosphate, ferric sodium, and metaldehyde. All of these help to suppress these populations. If you look on the right though, you can see how they appear. Um, many people have pointed out that these look like candy. They are also toxic to dogs. And so sometimes kids will pick them up and try and eat them. Dogs will lick them up and eat them and we can see some sickness result because of that exposure. So you do have to be very careful, uh, particularly of who you would let into the area where you put these baits down if you really need to knock back a big slug or snail problem. Now, I think that's the only gastropod that I have included into the talk uh, here tonight. If we look at some other things, 
Uh, one of the ones that pops up pretty frequently would be the aphids. Aphids are also known as plant lice. I've heard that terminology across Kentucky doing different talks. Um, there are many, does, uh, many different species of aphids that we can contend with. Um, one of the most common ones would be green peach aphid. If you grow sorghum or you know anybody that grows sorghum, you may hear about the sugarcane aphid um, that's getting on those plants. Um, we have different kinds of species that pop up just depending on, on what host we're dealing with, uh, melon aphids and all kinds. They are all united by a few traits. Um, one of the big ones is that they have a needle-like mouth part, which you see on the left there. They push that into their host plant that they're going to siphon fluids out from. And so they have an all-liquid diet. It's kind of an amazing way of being able to digest stuff. Imagine you drank or ate nothing but sort of Mountain Dew mixed with Sprite, and that is the dietary uh, sort of world that an aphid lives in. It is not very nutritious because of that. The aphids all also feature what we call cornicles. Cornicles are these sort of tailpipe looking objects that you see on the right. They look like uh, hot rod tailpipes that are sticking off the rear end of the insect. These are a part of their defensive systems. So they can actually exude a pheromone from there, an alarm pheromone. And as that comes out, it tells the other aphids, oh my goodness, there's something here, run away. And they'll all let go of the plant and hopefully fall down to the ground where they can escape a lady beetle or whatever it is that's trying to consume them. Many aphids are green. Uh, but there are different kinds of aphids that come in different colors. Red is another common sort of subtype. Yellow, if you grow milkweed on your property, you may encounter oleander aphids. Those are those kind of yellow-orange ones in the upper right-hand corner. They're also known for having black legs and black cornicles, um, so they stand apart from a lot of the other aphids. On your trees on your property, you may also see these big gray or black aphids that live on the bark of the tree. Those are called giant bark aphids, and they blend in pretty well. Um, until you start noticing some of the honeydew that's left behind by their feeding. The reason that aphids are a problem, they do feed quite a bit and the way that they're feeding can be traumatic to the plant. Um, they do sort of move pathogens around, but I would argue that the key factor that makes aphids so problematic is their ability to reproduce so quickly. Most aphid populations that we encounter uh, on an annual basis or seasonal basis, I should say, they're gonna be asexual populations. It'll be all females. The mama that lands, she will start laying versions, a clone versions of herself live, as you can see here. There's not eggs that are being put out. And then those aphids that she produces, they quickly develop within a few days, and then they're ready to reproduce themselves. So you can go from zero to 60 with these pests really, really fast. Um, it's quite amazing the way that they can build these populations up. And as they're feeding and building that population, there will be several symptoms that we may notice with them. Um, the first that most people are going to find are the curled and cupped leaves. You might think that the plants appear kind of drought stressed, but upon closer inspection and you kind of unfurl those leaves and look inside of them, you'll notice these green plant lice hanging out in there, feeding and causing that damage. They're feeding on that sort of vascular system, uh, on the circulatory system, if you will. And when they do that, it's what causes that kind of wilting appearance. The plants that are infested with aphids will also look quite dusty. Aphids, like all insects, have an exoskeleton, and in order to go from one stage of life to the next, they have to shed their exoskeleton to grow. Since there's so many of them on the plant, they make a lot of these excess exoskeletons. They get stuck to the plant, and so the plant will look kind of dusty or crusty, um, and when you start to get closer, you may see things moving and walking through there, but that's another common indicator for aphid problems. Then the other big thing is the honeydew. I kind of alluded to it a moment ago, but honeydew is the fecal material that's produced by sap feeding insects and aphids are kind of chief amongst these. So if you look at that leaf on the far left here, it looks kind of shiny and wet. If you touch it, your fingers will get stuck there. You'll leave fingerprints behind. And this is just sugary butt juice that the aphids have kind of dripped onto the plant, unfortunately. It does recruit black sooty mold. Interestingly, it also recruits other insects. On the far right here, you're seeing an ant that's actually feeding on honeydew. You didn't know you were gonna get this here around dinner time. You're watching bugs eat other bugs poop. It's great dinner time conversation. Uh, but what happens with ants is that they find these aphid populations and then they milk them. They let the aphids feed on the plant and then they will collect the honeydew as it's produced by the aphids and drink it up. It is like a big gulp from 7-Eleven for them. It's just this quick, refreshing treat. And then they'll farm the aphids. They will actually tend to them and they will keep other things away. Things like ladybugs that wanna eat the aphids or wasps that wanna lay their eggs in the aphids. 
the ants will actually protect them from those other from those predators and kind of tend to them like cattle or sheep. Um, it's quite amazing the sort of symbiosis that they have. Sometimes we actually end up having to do ant control in different agricultural areas to help cut down on aphid problems. Aphids are typically kept in check uh, by some of those natural enemies that I alluded to. Uh, lady beetles love to feed on these and uh, an individual ladybug is going to eat about 5,000 aphids in its life from egg to death. So as larvae and as adults, they feed on aphids. My little video there on the left is a lady beetle that's discovered some aphids. Apparently this one isn't producing the alarm pheromone that I alluded to before. It's just allowing itself to be slurped up like a, a, a spaghetti noodle for some reason. And it's just going to town on that bad boy and then no more aphid. Um, and it's gonna do this to more and more of them. Like I said, they eat quite a few in their life. Uh, lace wings also do this, a few others. We uh, sometimes have aphids sort of outcompete these natural enemies though. So they outstrip these natural enemies' abilities to suppress them, and we get outbreak situations. In those cases, we do have some options for control. Depending on whether you're organic or whether you are more conventional, you could use pyrethroids, uh, things like bifenthrin, lambda cyhalothrin. Uh, all of those different options are going to work against aphids fairly well. Uh, you just spray it on top. It's a contact product, and you'll get the control that you want. It may take multiple applications because you may have some kind of lurking in the background um, that you didn't get or you missed on the undersides of the leaves. That is sort of the key thing is not just treating the top of the leaf, but also getting the stems and also getting the undersides of the leaves. So blasting up from the ground. Insecticidal soaps also work quite well against aphids. And when I say an insecticidal soap, I do not necessarily mean that you mix up a bunch of Dawn dish soap or ivory dish soap into a bucket and then you pour that soap onto the aphids. Insecticidal soap is an actual product. You will see it online or at large retail gardening centers where it is specifically formulated as this kind of long chain fatty acid thing uh, that will help to destroy insects. So look for insecticidal soap as well. We can also get really simple with aphids. A jet of water, if you don't have a lot of plants to tend to, you can just blast them off the plant they usually get down on the ground and are devoured by different insects that are down there and they don't make their way back up. You can also use some systemic insecticides, things like neonicotinoids and a few others that will be taken up by the plant from the root zone and then the plant is protected for the entire growing season. Unfortunately, I can't go into too much detail about that because it would depend on what plants you're growing. I would encourage you to look at ID 36, which is our extension publication and it can, it'll list out a lot of the different options for you uh, in terms of aphid control and aphid control by crop. Oh, I see I got a chat question here. Oh, it was Philip. Tell everybody to use the chat. Uh, so one of the other pests that I frequently do uh, talk about when I get these kinds of invitations is squash vine borer. Now, I will admit to dealing with squash vine borer myself last summer. Uh, this is maybe a bit shameful as an entomologist, but Last year, my brother came down from Indiana. I have a very weird backyard. It's kind of a hill that's, that was terraced. And in the terracing, we decided uh, we would build these raised beds. It looks quite nice. I, I, we're proud of it. Um, we put it in and I was going to raise all this stuff. And there's some garden space next to it. I really wanted to grow a giant pumpkin. That was my goal for 2022. I wanted to grow a 200 pound pumpkin. And I had this one vine and it was just tray magnifique. It was a beautiful pumpkin vine. And I was like, this is the one, this is gonna give me this giant pumpkin, I really know it. And it was about June 1st and I thought, I need to, I need to start paying attention for squash vine borer. I need to be on the lookout for this. And I was too late. They were already in the vine. You can see some of the caterpillars here in this image on the right. And they were feeding internally. This is an extremely destructive pest. If you're not on top of your game with it, it just, it'll wipe you out. It takes you out at the card table, basically. Um, the adult, as you see on the left here, it is something that is kind of unique looking. Uh, this is a day flying wasp mimic moth. So it resembles some of our different paper wasps. It has this crimson and silver coloration. My joke is that it kind of looks like an Ohio State fan. They are obvious when they fly around, they look unique and so people notice them. Uh, but if you're not looking for them, you may miss them. And then you end up with these caterpillars like you see on the right. They love to feed in our vine crops, summer and winter squashes included, as well as pumpkins. That was where they were my big time enemy. As an entomologist, I do like to look around online, kind of see what people are saying about different insects. 
I found a blog post that was all about squash vine bore, and it featured a picture of somebody that was out in the field with their partner in crime, kind of their fellow farmer. It, this is what she thought of squash vine bore. So we've got some pumpkin plants that looks like running. Um, she blurted it out for posterity's sake, I guess, but basically flipping off this pest. It's something that it sneaks up on you, and if you're not prepared, it really does cause a lot of damage, and you just it's hard to recover from, unfortunately. And that's because of the way that it feeds. The caterpillar form is a boring pest. Not that it's not exciting, but boring in that it chews its way into a pumpkin or squash plant and then feeds inside of the vine. So it's a lot like things like uh, uh, the wood boring moths that get into our trees, peach borer and some of those others, but it uses this annual plant instead. When it's doing this, it's feeding, caterpillars are well known for when they feed inside of plants, instead of sort of stockpiling their frass, their fecal material inside with them, they will instead sort of push it out through the hole that they pre create. And uh, then you'll see it sort of accumulating on the outside of the plant. In the case of these pests, it's this kind of orange goo that you see sticking out. And uh, unfortunately, once you see that, it's usually curtains. You're not gonna be able to do too much to save that plant. Uh, you do have some options. I notice a lot of calls in July but the adults begin flying and mating in, in June and July. Um, that's when the adults first start to emerge and then the first generation of this pest gets going. Now, there are options that we can use to try and prevent that damage that I was just talking about. In terms of IPM, what we would be talking about oops, is uh, monitoring. So like I said, this is a pretty interesting looking moth. So you may notice it just sort of flowing around out, floating around outside if you have your eyes open. But you can also directly monitor for them by using yellow pan traps. In this case, this is just a plastic bowl that's yellow, it has to have that yellow color. That yellow is very appealing to the female squash vine borer, and so she will fly straight towards it. She thinks it's a highly stressed plant. If you put some soapy water in there, they'll get stuck in the soapy water and drown, and then you can monitor. And the first one that you see is when you're going to take some action. Um, in regards to these pan traps, if you're going to try it, I would encourage you to also uh, glue or tape things like heavy metal washers on the bottom, something that will keep the trap where you want it to be because they will blow away in these high winds that we've been experiencing. So if you're doing that monitoring, there are some options for control. If you haven't been doing the monitoring and unfortunately you end up with the pest, there is a physical method, kind of mechanical method, I should say, that will help to control squash vine borer. And it involves going to infested plants and finding the hole that the caterpillar used to get inside, and then taking a clean knife or scalpel, and then slicing that vine upwards towards the apex of the plant and peeling the vine apart slowly and gently so you don't break it, and trying to find the caterpillar. Once you find it, you pull it out, you squish it, you curse its name down to Hades, and you throw it to the dirt, um, or you can throw it in a bucket of soapy water, whichever really suits your fancy. Um, some people have told me they like to stab them. I'm not going to recommend that because you could poke your hand. Uh, some people don't like the idea of using a knife in that fashion. So the other option would be to take a paper clip and you unfold it until you get kind of a long, skinny metal rod. And then you go down the plant and you slide it into the damaged areas. And when you feel some resistance, uh, a change in resistance in particular, that'll be an indicator that you have found the vine borer and you've pierced it and it will perish because of what you've done to it. After you get done with either of these activities though, you're going to take the plant and squish it back together, or you're gonna take it and just lay it down if you've been using the paperclip method. In both instances, you'll heap about two inches of soil on top of it. And then your hope is that it'll reroot somewhere along there and start running again, uh, and the plant will still survive. It's about a 50-50 chance. It doesn't work every time, uh, but it's better than nothing uh, is what I would say. If you have been monitoring for the pest and you wanna do some sort of preventive strategy for it, one of the things that we can do is right when you catch the first one, if you're willing to, uh, as you're planting the, the crops, as you're planting these plants, building these small hoop houses that we see here or a low tunnel, if you're a longer uh, a row, if you're doing this more commercially, uh, if you can build these smaller areas uh, of protection, it's a force field that will keep the squash vine borer from getting to the plants. And so this is just stapled down. You make sure that it's secure so they can't crawl in there. 
The other piece of advice I give people is that you should double check once you get it secured that you haven't just sort of trapped a bunch of the moths inside with the plants, otherwise they are going to die. Uh, the other thing with this is it does complicate pollination. Some people would prefer to leave these on all summer because we do have multiple generations of this pest. They just start kind of popping up throughout the growing season after the first one. And so some people want to leave this on and you can, but then you do need to get under there and hand pollinate with a paintbrush. Um, you can also take it off about two or three weeks after you first put it on because at that point, all the eggs will have been laid and are hatching and going in. Uh, but you'll need to put your traps back out and monitor for when the adults are flying again so that when you know, you know when to reinstall the, the row cover. So that is an option. The other thing we can do are insecticides at the base of the plant every 10 days uh, for most of the rest of the growing season. Again, that's going to be things like seven, um, which is a pyrethroid now, and then ortho bug be gone max, another pyrethroid. These are contact products. The hope is that as the female lands on the plant, so after you first notice one landing in your soapy trap, um, you're going to put these products on there. So when they go to lay their eggs, they encounter a lethal dose of the insecticide and they keel over without being successful. There aren't any systemic options as far as I'm aware that have been tested by universities that will work. You may read online about some people who inject their plants with BT. Uh, that's not labeled. You may hear a lot of people reporting success with that, but as the university, we can't necessarily support that because nobody has done the research to prove that it's safe and works. Another squash plant that I often end up talking about is the squash bug. So this is another hemipteran, so a true bug like the aphid. They feed on winter squash and pumpkins. They spread yellow vine disease. They are shiny and slightly oval, as you can see here. They have kind of a shield-like appearance, a more elongated than a stink bug though. They're copper colored with kind of a mottled appearance. If I was going to compare this insect to another one, I would say it looks like a brown marmorated stink bug that was on Weight Watchers. It's very skinny compared to the brown marmorated stink bug. When we see these, they are laying eggs frequently or feeding on the plant. Their eggs are uh, interesting because they're copper colored and they're found on the leaves in between veins. You can see some on the left there. Those eggs, once they're laid, in about 10 days, they will hatch and the first instar nymphs of the squash bug will emerge. They're black and green with kind of red eyes, as you see here. This usually starts to happen in early June in the garden. So when this happens, they're gonna start growing and mating. And then again, we get these overlapping generations, which complicates control things, uh, controlling things. We usually like it when we have set one or two generations per year. When you get these overlaps, that's when it becomes difficult to fully eliminate a pest problem. When they feed, they're sucking juices from the plant. And so when they do that, the leaves will curl. These ones also induce what we call stippling, which is on the left here. It looks like pixelation in the leaves. So if you have aphids on your squash plant or, or pumpkin plant, the leaves will just curl and droop. If it's squash bug, you'll see this pixelation in the leaf, this kind of dotting. These will also feed on developing fruits, which causes scarring and sometimes the death of the young fruit, unfortunately. And you can also see a very sort of sickly looking plant here on the right. In regards to control, physical control really is the best method for squash bugs going through and collecting adults into buckets of soapy water. It can be tough when they're on the leaves. They're kind of on the go and they're fast, so it can be hard to snag them. Uh, some people have reported success by putting boards out in the garden or in the, in the field. And then you go through uh, during the, the, the latter half of the day and you flip the boards over and you find them under there and you can sort of pick them up or sweep them into a bucket of soapy water to kill them. Crushing the eggs in the spring is also very effective. I know that me and my daughter, she's six, so you know she's really into kind of the bloods and guts. And so we'll go through the garden and we'll squish the eggs in the spring when we see them in between those veins. And then the big one is sanitation, whether garden or field sanitation, any debris that's left behind becomes overwintering habitat for these. And so stripping that out and throwing it away will save you a lot of headache the next year. Uh, pyrethroids are an insecticide option for, uh, for squash bug. Then I've got a couple of beetle pests that I wanted to talk about with you here today. The first one is Colorado potato beetle, also known just as CPD. It is a common pest of potatoes in Kentucky, as well as tomatoes and peppers. So all of those kind of nightshade or solanaceous plants, as you can imagine. They are pests both as adults and as larvae. 
the adult cause sort of notching damage in the leaves, which you see on the left, whereas the larvae, which are on the right, they create this more ragged appearance as they feed on the plant. Colorado potato beetle is an absolutely interesting insect. Um, their scientific name translates to tin lines because the adults have these tin distinct lines on their back. They also have kind of this Rorschach ink blot pattern on their thorax and kind of a unique cream and black and copper color to them. They're also very famous across the world. This is one of the invasive species that has come from America and gone to other countries. So we have accidentally introduced the Colorado potato beetle to mainland Europe and other places. In communist Germany, after the, the Second World War and then during the Cold War, they had this huge propaganda campaign around this pest. They called it the Ami Koffer, the American beetle, or Off Dame Kartoffel Koffer, which means the potato beetle. Um, they actually thought that this was an insidious plot by the United States and the CIA, uh, that we were dropping them from planes. That's what you see in the middle propaganda image, and that we were infesting their country and trying to starve their people out. Uh, they actually lodged a complaint with a human rights organization against us over this. There's no evidence that we did it on purpose. I just want to throw that out there. Uh, but it is an invasive species that we've introduced to other places. The adults, like I mentioned, have that distinct coloration and 10 black stripes. The immature form, they're very bulbous. Um, these are leaf beetles uh, by family name. And so leaf beetles as immatures, they're often big and squishy looking. They have these big butts, as you can see here. Um, they're voracious feeders. The Colorado potato beetle larva, they start out with a brick red coloration. And as they age, they take on more of a pink or salmon color. Uh, and they have black heads and two rows of dark dots along the sides of their bodies. The Colorado potato beetle is another one that overwinters as an adult. They're in the soil, in the fields. And then a lot of times people put potatoes after potatoes after potatoes. And so they're in the right place to be successful. When they first emerge as adults after overwintering, they usually feed on volunteer potatoes. Um, if people are trying to go out early with potatoes, they'll get on those, or they'll just feed on weeds that are growing nearby, nightshade type weeds. Females will lay their eggs in batches of about 24. They put them on the undersides of leaves. The eggs will hatch in about four to nine days. Then the larvae feed for two to three weeks. They can complete their total development in about 21 days. So we can get tons of generations of these every summer. There are some IPM-based options for dealing with CPB. Well, the biggest one is kind of what I was alluding to a moment ago. If you just keep putting potatoes in the same spot, you're basically feeding lions. Um, you don't want to do that. You want to try and get potatoes out of that area for a growing season or maybe two. And then whatever beetles are there, they'll either die out or move on um, and hopefully not come back after you switch back to potatoes in that uh, next year. They can also feed, like I said, on these weeds. So things like ground cherry or just wild nightshade. If you can do some weed sanitation and get rid of these, um, then the beetles won't be as successful early in the growing season. And they won't be able to have high populations on the potatoes when they do arrive. Hand removal is an option that may vary uh, in its appeal field to field, depending on how many potatoes you have. People have been very inventive with Colorado potato beetle. This is a video I found online. I can't find the plans for this device this man has constructed, but it seems to be the front of a bicycle, which has been removed from the back end. And then he has, in some fashion, put these brushes on there so that as the chain moves, the brushes sweep the plant and hit the beetle larva and adults into this metal container. And if we follow the camera towards the metal container, if we look down in there, there's thousands of, of insects in there that have been removed very quickly, very efficiently. Um, but if you can pluck them off by hand and drop them in buckets of soapy water, you will cut down on a lot of damage and recruitment to the plants. It's also an insect that's famous for its ability to develop insecticide resistance. Unfortunately, we have sprayed them with various things so often for so long that they are able to overcome a lot of our chemistry. Um, this has been a problem with them, particularly because they feed on potatoes. They are also, uh, since they're feeding on those potatoes, they're detoxifying the sort of natural, uh, I guess, defenses of potatoes and other nightshade plants. And this predisposes them to be able to overcome our insecticides. So if you're going to spray Colorado potato beetle, you need to practice uh, insecticide rotation. Look at the top of your insecticidal product. You will see what's called the IRAC number. It'll say group something of insecticide. In this case, it's a group 4A product. 
you may see threes or three A's or three B's. You may see twos. You may see 28s. It just depends on what product you're using. If you spray a population of pests with one of these numbers and letters in the growing season, the next application that you make needs to come from another group. If you do successive applications with the same type of product, you are breeding for these insects to become resistant. In terms of Colorado potato beetle, there are some options for treating the soil at the time of the planting. If you wanna take a picture of this slide uh, or look up ID 36 or ID 128, those are the ones that have these tables in them. You can see there's options for treating the soil with different neonicotinoids and other products that, that will be systemically protecting the plant. There's also some contact products, um, different things like uh, pyrethroids and a few others. Pyrethroids, your, your efficacy will vary. Um, we have newer products like Corrigen, which would be a, a restricted use product. That's an anthranilic diamide type product. You would see a lot of success with it as well though. Um, these options will help you to suppress the population. Unfortunately, if you have big Colorado potato beetle problems, it's hard to be organic unless you're willing to go out there and do the sweat equity to pick them off the plant. Um, it's not something that's easy to control for with organic pesticides. So you may have to look at some of these synthetic options. I was specifically requested to include Mexican bean beetles in the discussion here tonight. It's a very interesting pest, I would say. They're actually a lady beetle. They're kind of the black sheep of the lady beetle family, unfortunately, because uh, as a rule, lady beetles are beneficial predators. This one is a plant feeder though, and they're quite voracious when they feed. So they're a large 16 spotted lady beetle. You can see uh, on this image on the right here, when they feed, um, they do so as adults and as larva. They usually feed between the veins of the leaf. They can create damage that is sort of superficially similar to a Japanese beetle, kind of a lacy-like appearance after they're done with the plant. Again, they overwinter as adults. You'll notice with a lot of our agricultural pests, this is a key factor in their life cycle because it gives them an early jump on the growing season. They're able to get ahead of their competitors because they overwinter as adults. So they'll do this in, under plant debris and open fields, also in wooded areas. In the spring, those adults will emerge and then they mate and lay eggs on newly growing plants. Their preferred hosts are lima beans and snap beans. They'll also use cow pea and soybean as well though. There is a lot of overlapping damage with this pest because the larvae, as they hatch from their eggs, they will feed on the leaves with their parents and then complete their development and then they'll do the same with their children. So there's all of this sort of overlapping issue with them. The larvae are the more damaging stage though. Uh, there's an interesting sort of difference between the adults and larvae where the adults are found on the upper sides of the leaves. And in that area, they're slow movers. They're known for being kind of bumbling. But if you do disturb them, they'll bend their knees. And lady beetles do this thing where they can reflexively bleed out of their knees. I'm very thankful that we don't have that problem, right? We just need knee replacements, but we don't exude uh, sort of toxic blood from our knees when we bend down. But these ones can, and they exude that out to try and scare off predators. This is a graph from Purdue University showing the life cycle of Mexican bean beetle in Indiana. It's very similar in Kentucky. We may, uh, in, in certain growing seasons, have more generations than Indiana just because it's a little colder up there. Uh, the larval stages, on, uh, I wanted to finish this thought though, is that they're more common on the undersides of leaves in comparison to those adults. But again, you have all of this overlapping feeding and damage. Um, you can see it's a problem basically from the start of the growing season until the end, unfortunately. Uh, we do have two to three generations, uh, unfortunately, which means more damage. If you can intercept them before they've caused about 30% damage to the plant, you'll still be able to save it and get a crop off of it. Again, pyrethroids are something that kill this particular pest. Multiple applications would be necessary um, in order to try and control them. Uh, that means spraying with them one time, switching, and then going back to them potentially. One thing that you could switch to is an organic product called neem. Neem would also kill Mexican bean beetles as you apply it to them. These are all contact products or ingested products, though. Um, floating row covers, as we talked about for squash vine borer, also work to exclude this pest. Hand picking, and then most importantly, garden sanitation. That's the most important thing with a lot of these, is getting rid of their overwintering habitat cuts down on the success of them from 2023 into 2024. The last pest I wanted to visit with you about tonight are these hornworms. 
Um, hornworms, I think, are adorable. I have a farm of hornworms that I rear every year, so we have them in our insect zoo, but they're also the bane of many a tomato grower. In Kentucky, you can have tomato hornworm or tobacco hornworm feeding on your tomato plants. You can tell the difference by looking at the horn. So the horn is on the rear end. That is one of the tricky things about these. That horn being back there tricks birds into thinking that is the head end. Um, it helps to protect their main brain up in the head. Uh, my daughter calls these butt unicorns because of where the horn is located. But if you look at them, there is some difference in coloration. The tomato hornworm has a bluish colored horn, whereas the tobacco hornworm has a reddish colored horn. There's also differences in the patterns that are on the sides of their body. Tobacco hornworms have white slashes on every segment of their body, whereas the tomato hornworm has a V or a chevron that's kind of a white cream color. Uh, they cause the same damage. They both become sort of brownish moths with orange dots along their side. If you look on the left here, you can see their eggs are these kind of greenish orbs. When they first emerge, they're more horn than worm, I would say. Uh, it's about half and half, you can see there. But as they feed, they quickly grow, and then they pupate. This one is interesting because they overwinter as pupa rather than as adults, like we've talked about with some of these other pests. But again, this is something that gets them kind of an early start. By being a pupa down in the soil, they can warm up and the adults can get started earlier in the growing season. The first generation completes their development within about a month. And then the second generation will be born by late summer and ready to pupate and go down into the soil and overwinter. Hornworms feed mainly on the leaves uh, and fruit. Uh, they begin with the upper leaves and then slowly move their way down in the canopy to the lower leaves because they want to prolong the amount of time that they can use that plant. They can also consume the entire leaf. They can chew large gashes into the fruit, as you see here, uh, which looks almost like rodent damage. Uh, here's a plant that's being decimated by hornworms. Some of you have no doubt experienced this. They can be difficult to spot, even though they're such big, girthy caterpillars. They do blend in quite well. When they feed on the plant, they take on that greenish color. Um, but when they feed, they also create frass that is pretty obvious. Um, their frass is known for looking like a hand grenade. You can see it on the right there. Uh, you can see that sort of segmentation like you might see in a, in a standard issue army hand grenade. These are big when they first come out because they're wet, but as they dry, they still re retain that sort of hand grenade appearance. So you'll see these in pots of, of tomatoes or in the field, or collecting in leaves that are kind of cupped up uh, and sticking upward. The caterpillar pests are typically kept in check by various natural enemies. Things like bacteria can get into them. Lace wings feed on them. We also have paper wasps that will devour them. This is one that's chewing down on one. And then we have this parasitoid wasp that lays their eggs in the hornworms. If you ever see a hornworm with all of these kind of white tubes or white jars sticking out of the back, I would encourage you to not bother that one. It's an incubator for these beneficial organisms, and all of those wasps are going to emerge and provide you some feed free pest control. Uh, this is kind of what it looks like when it happens. They're pushing their way out. Those are wasp larvae, and then they'll spin that white cocoon around their body. Uh, that caterpillar is no longer a factor, really. They have caused damage, unfortunately, before this point, uh, but it is good to have these wasps around. They keep the, the population in check. We do have outbreak years, unfortunately things line up for them to be very successful. We also see hornworms become a big problem in high tunnels. If you're somebody that's planning to put tomatoes in a high tunnel, you'll have a couple of growing seasons where you'll have a honeymoon phase and you won't see a lot of pests. But once the hornworms find the tunnel, they actually find that it excludes their natural enemies, it protects them. And so their populations boom inside of high tunnels, they devour the plants and cause a lot of damage. So what do we do about these? I've talked a lot about sort of these IPM methods, which include destroying overwintering habitat. With this pest, that involves tilling. You have to till down into the soil to try and either excavate the, the pupa that's down there or crush it with the tiller itself. Uh, you can either destroy it or expose it to the elements or predators. You can also hand pick these. If you know that you have tomatoes, you know you're gonna deal with these going through and monitoring and picking them off and throwing them in buckets of soapy water will destroy them and cut down on the problem. You can also monitor for them by shaking the plants over a sheet of cardboard on the ground. That'll help you find the smaller ones. And then you can treat with BT, Bacillus thuringiensis. That works quite well against these caterpillars when they're smaller. But if you miss that early window, 
you may have to go with something like a, a, a carbaryl or a different pyrethroid product. If they're small, you can still get them with things like spinosad as well. So there's lots of options. Again, ID36 and ID128 provide these tables of insecticides that can help you to control them. I appreciate the time to join you here over Zoom tonight. I would also be open to any questions that we have here as we kind of wrap up. Okay. Uh, while, while we're giving them time to put in the chat, uh, Rebecca is going to put the link for the May 1st Regional Farmers Market Meeting. If you don't care, go ahead and click on that link if you plan on attending. That way we can get uh, a good account for the meal. Uh, one question I've got here, Doc, while I'm waiting on everybody, that cold spell that we had back in December, the real frigid temperatures, will that have any effect, or do you think that will have any effect on insect populations this year? Unfortunately, probably not. With insects, they're very talented at finding these kind of nooks and crannies that will protect them from those cold air temperatures. So even though it was like negative 10 in the air, if you are in the soil, it's a balmy 40 or 45 degrees under that grass or whatever's growing above you. If you're underneath a log, again, you're still kind of uh, protected from those cold temperatures, just enough to sort of survive. Insects have what we call a lethal temperature and then a lethal amount of time of exposure. So my best example is bed bugs. Bed bugs die at zero degrees Fahrenheit, but they have to be zero degrees Fahrenheit for exactly like five days. If that zero degrees is broken any time in that five day span, the clock resets. And so, no, we don't get a lot of free pest control from old man winter, unfortunately. Okay. What is a good spray for apple trees to prevent black spot on apples? Uh, I am, don't know about black spot. I apologize. I'm on the, on the bug side. I, I can check with our pathologist though. Well, Molly, we'll, we'll, me and April follow up with you on that one. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll follow up with that. Um, anybody else have any questions? We have one right here. Will a locust borer attack a garden? I couldn't hear you. A locust borer, will it attack garden vegetables? Locust borer? No, that should only be in your locust trees. Uh, they may visit flowers on different plants. They sometimes visit those, but uh, it would be a different pest that was bothering your, your vegetable plants. Okay. All right. What about monitoring bricks level in plants regarding aphids? I've heard that higher bricks, less aphids. Uh -huh. I actually just heard about this recently myself. Uh, another a different extension agent, Alexa Sheffield down in Boyle County. Um, she was we were sort of talking about this because she'd heard a podcast about it. I have not seen any data about that. That sounds like something that would be very interesting to me. Um, we were talking, we were banning the idea about of, of doing a sort of applied research trial to see if there was any efficacy to that. But unfortunately, right now, I couldn't tell you, yes, 100% that you would, you would get control if you increase those brick levels, bricks levels, I have to enunciate more. Well, I don't see any more questions, Doc. Uh, just one more reminder, the next meeting is the 20th. It'll start at six o'clock, and that is our senior and with voucher training. Uh, There's if, another question. Okay. The best animal to raise for pest control. Uh, I would say chickens, I guess. If you have chickens, you can often feed them some of these different uh, critters that you shake off plants. I've also had people tell me they use guinea fowl to do that. Um, I don't know that I would turn them loose necessarily in a field or in a garden to do that, but you can capture the insects and feed them to those. Or kids. Kids are good bounty hunters. Give them a penny a head for every Japanese beetle they find or Mexican bean beetle. I think that's a good bounty hunting system as well. Uh, all right. Thank you very much. <laughs> Anytime. Any other questions? Really good questions tonight. Thank you for coming, everybody. I appreciate you taking time out of your evening to learn about bugs. And then once we get this posted, we will send out the link. Oh, what about wireworms, Doc? Uh, they feed on potatoes. What were, what, were you, uh, what would you like to know about them? I'm going to assume control methods. Uh, crop rotation is one with those to get away from uh, having the same crops there over and over again. 
You can also have things that go in the ground with sort of systemic products to try and uh, protect them. Uh, there are resistant varieties occasionally out there for uh, different, different ones. You could try the pyrethroids as well. Uh, those would be things that, that would uh, provide some control. But if you were looking for more of the sort of uh, the systemic options, that would be a midacloprid uh, by and large. Thiamethoxam, I think, would be another one. Those are neonicotinoids that you could put down in the soil and as the plant grows they would accrue that pesticide and kill the wireworms. Are wireworms more often found after like you plow up sod versus a garden that's been in production for a few years? I would say wireworms sort of, but white grubs are actually the one we associate more with that. If you take out turf and you put potatoes in right after, the white grubs will switch from feeding on the turf roots to feeding only on the potatoes and they'll devour the whole thing. They'll get inside of them. Okay. What is a what is the best general use pesticide for pumpkins? Pumpkins. Uh, you'd be looking at pyrethroids again there, uh, something that was broad spectrum. Carbaryl is an older one that's harder to find now, but those would be sort of broad spectrum kind of catch-alls is, is a term we would use for that. Good deal. Any other questions? We uh, did a great job tonight, Doc. Appreciate it. Anytime. Uh, you're bringing out the questions. I think this is probably one of That's the most good. questions that we've had in a session. That means they're engaged. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Philip. Thank you, April. Other agents, maybe I'm not seeing. Macy. I'll catch y'all later. All right. Sounds great. Thank y'all. Have a good night. Safe travels. Anytime. You too. Bye.